This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning and welcome to this online service for First Lutheran Church and Preschool. My name is Pastor Andy Jones and it's wonderful that you could join us this morning for worship. A few announcements before we begin this service today. I'll be having an outdoor sort of open house communion time coming up on Saturday, January 23rd. This is from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. We did this in December and I thought it was a great success. So please do come and receive the Lord's Supper then. There's also going to be several other things that you can bring and pick up during that time. You can bring your, your mites, you can bring food for the share barrel. You can also pick up your giving statement from 2020, and if you don't pick it up, we'll mail it out, no worries. Uh, but also, one of the things that you can pick up is I'm going to have these small bottles of ashes that you can take home. And when we get to Ash Wednesday on February 17th, we'll be doing a service for that, but you'll be doing it from home. And so we'll, we'll go through what you'll need to do with those ashes then, but please do come and pick all of those things up. Also coming up, we have a voters meeting on Sunday, January the 24th. This will take place via Zoom once more and it'll be at 10.30 a.m. So please pay attention for the link that will come out about that. We've got a few things to discuss, but nothing major at this point. So please do come to that voters meeting. We also have a Bible study after the service today at 10.30 via Zoom, so please join us for that. We're studying the book of Psalms at the moment, and we'll be on Psalm 8 today. And finally, there's a bunch of other things in First Notes, so please do check out the First Notes newsletter that we send out each week and read up on all that's happening at First Lutheran Church and Preschool. You should have found the bulletin for, the, for this service in the description of this video. If you haven't yet, go check that out so that you can follow along with me. We begin today with the opening hymn, Open Now Thy Gates of Beauty. Continue with the confession and absolution. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done, and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Is this your confession? Yes. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die and rise for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The psalm for today is Psalm 139. If you would read the parts in bold along with me. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up, you discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. 
Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all together. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If, my, if I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. A reminder to check out our children's chat videos. This week there's one by Miss Shannon Carr. And today our readings are done by Ida Thomason. The Old Testament reading is found in 1 Samuel chapter 3, beginning at the first verse. Now the young man Samuel was ministering to the Lord under Eli, and the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no frequent vision. At that time Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his own place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called Samuel, and he said, Here I am, and ran to Eli, and said, Here I am, for you called me. But Sam Eli said, I did not call, lie down again. So he went and lay down. And the Lord called again, Samuel. And Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call my son, lie down again. Now Samuel did not know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. And the Lord called Samuel again the third time. And he arose, and he went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the young man. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go, lie down. And if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. And the Lord came and stood, calling as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, for your servant hears. Then the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I am about to do a thing in Israel, at which the two ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. On that day I will fulfill against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house, from beginning to end. And I declare to him that I am about to punish his house forever for the iniquity that he knew, because his sons were blaspheming God, and he did not restrain them. Therefore I swear to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be atoned by for sacrifice or offering forever. Samuel lay until morning, and he opened the doors of the house of the Lord, and Samuel was afraid to tell the vision to Eli. But Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son. And he said, Here I am. And Eli said, What was it that he told you? Do not hide it from me. May God do so to you, and more also, if you hide anything from me of all that he told you. So Samuel told him everything, and hid nothing from him. And he said, It is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. And Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, knew that Samuel was established as the prophet of the Lord. The epistle lesson is found in Corinthians chapter 6, beginning at the 12th verse. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be enslaved by anything. Food is meant for the stomach, and the stomach for food, and God will destroy both one and the other. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord, and will also raise us up by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For as it is written, the two will become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body. But the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you? whom you have from God, 
you are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. The Gospel reading for today comes from John chapter 1. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip went and found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said to him, Behold, an Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God, you are the King of Israel. Jesus answered him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. We sing the sermon hymn, Speak, O Lord, Your Servant Listens. Speak, O Lord, Your Servant Listens. Let Your words Death's dread power, its inward strife, wars against your word of life. Fill me, Lord, with love's strong fervor, that I cling to you forever. Oh, what blessing to be near you, and to listen to your voice. Let me ever love and Grace, mercy, and peace to you from our Lord, Savior, and Caller, Jesus Christ. Amen. The text for this sermon is the Old Testament reading from 1 Samuel 3, especially these words in verse 10. The Lord came and stood, calling again as at the other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel answered and said, Speak, your servant hears. Today we continue our sermon series on the prophets and the light that they shed on God's people. Last week we were looking at John the Baptist and his call for us to repent. And today we look at the prophet Samuel. Samuel is one of the most interesting characters in the entirety of the scriptures. Samuel is a miraculous person from his birth to his death and even beyond, quite frankly. Samuel's mother, Hannah, was not able to have children. She was barren. And yet she goes before the Lord and prays to him, asking him to remember her. And he does. 
he gives her the child Samuel. And out of gratefulness for God's gift of a son, she gives Samuel over to serve the Lord in his temple, in his place of worship at a very young age. Hannah is blessed with five other children as well, but Samuel grows up and serves under the priest and judge of the Lord, Eli. He is the priest and judge of all Israel at this time. And Samuel grows up serving Eli from this very young age. And as we get to our Old Testament reading for today, we find a young boy, Samuel, lying down in the presence of God, in the presence of the Ark of the Covenant. Now, this may sound really, really strange to us today, but the Ark of the Covenant was this holy object where God's presence truly dealt, truly dwelt among his people. If you're a fan of Indiana Jones, you might be a bit familiar with it. But the Ark of the Covenant is where God existed, where he dwelt with his people. And it was designed in this very, very particular, meticulous way so that it created sort of this golden chest. Inside of the chest, there were some holy objects like Aaron's staff, the Ten Commandments that God had written with his own hand, and some manna from the wilderness when the Israelites were wandering after they had escaped from Egypt. But the top of the Ark of the Covenant was called the mercy seat. It was sort of where God was, uh, where his throne was. It was a seat, a throne where God would, would sit and judge the world, so to speak. And this object was truly powerful. There are numerous occasions where this object, when it is touched, kills people. It is a dangerous object. It is full of power. And here is Samuel, the boy, just sleeping on the floor in the presence of the Ark of the Covenant. No one else is around. It's just Samuel and Eli. And Eli is getting quite old. He's going blind and he probably needs a lot of help. So Samuel has probably heard, heard Eli calling in the middle of the night, needing help for something on numerous occasions. And all of a sudden, Samuel hears a cry. He hears his name, Samuel. And he gets up and he runs to Eli because who else would be calling him? But Eli hasn't called Samuel. He sends him back and says, go back to sleep. I didn't call you. And it happens a second time. Samuel hears his name and he runs to Eli. And Eli tells him, no, go back to sleep. And it happens a third time. And Samuel runs to Eli. But on the third time, Eli realizes what is happening. The Lord is calling to Samuel. And so Eli instructs Samuel, go back and lie down. And he tells him what to say when the Lord speaks to him again. And on the fourth time, as God calls out to Samuel, 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 Samuel simply says, speak, your servant hears. The gospel in this story is maybe really subtle and, and maybe we, we miss it on occasion. But to me, the truest good news that we can take away from this story is that God is a persevering God. God does not give up on calling to us, even when we don't hear him the first time, or the second, third, fourth, tenth time. God never gives up on calling to his people. He keeps calling. Even when we ignore him, even when we run the other way, he keeps calling. He keeps calling to Samuel until Samuel hears and understands. We live in a world today where people are afraid of missing out on things. If you pay any attention to advertisements or retail, there is always a sale going on and the sale is only for a limited amount of time. It's only these days. And so the message that is delivered to us over and over again is act now. You've got to come fast. This has to happen now. If you don't act now, you're going to miss it. You're going to miss it. And this driving force of fearing that we're going to miss out on things drives us to act so quickly and be in such a hurry all the time. And it can begin to erode our ability to discern what is best. We feel this pressure to act now and we might make bad decisions. Now, 
I do encourage you to slow down a bit. I do encourage you to take a step back and take a deep breath. But that's not my point with this. My point with this is that's not how God works. God doesn't call Samuel once and then give up forever. Well, you missed it. Sorry, kid. God calls him and calls him again and again until Samuel hears, until Samuel listens, until Samuel understands. And God does the same thing with us. Sometimes we live life afraid that if we don't do exactly the right thing at exactly the right time, our entire lives will be ruined. But that's not how God works. God calls us again and again and again, and he puts us back on the right path even when we go the wrong way. God knows what to do when we take detours. He's okay with that. I'm actually a living example of that. God keeps calling us into his service just like he called Samuel. He never, ever gives up on us. Of course, what's interesting is that the message that Samuel is given isn't good news. The message that Samuel is given is that his master Eli is about to be overthrown. Eli's house is about to be devastated because of Eli's lack of initiative, his lack of keeping his sons in check, and his sons have committed grave, great sins. Samuel hears God's word, and he knows that he's probably going to have to deliver this to Eli, but he is terrified to do so. The text says that when morning comes, Samuel is afraid. And Eli tells him, you got to tell me. You have to tell me what the Lord said. And he does, but he's afraid to do so. I don't know about you, but I can definitely relate to the fear that Samuel has of proclaiming God's word. Because God's word is not always good news. Sometimes God's word is a word of destruction, devastation, judgment. Sometimes God's word is indeed very good news of forgiveness, life, and salvation. But at other times, it is not. Sometimes delivering God's word is an absolute joy and delight. And other times, it can be quite scary, quite frankly. Because people do not always meet God's word in the way that we might expect. There are basically three ways that people respond when they hear God's word. There's probably more, but I'm just going to pay attention to three today. The first is to respond in anger, to respond uh, in, in wrath and hostility. And we see this occur with all sorts of prophets through the Old and New Testament and all sorts of apostles that go out after Jesus' resurrection from the dead. We saw it with John the Baptist last week. He proclaimed repent. Herod didn't like it. Herod put him in jail and Herod killed him. Sometimes when we proclaim God's word, the result is persecution, imprisonment, even death. And we see that with prophets like Jeremiah, Jeremiah, prophets like Elisha, Moses, and the apostles, Peter, James, John, Paul. All of these are met with hostility as they proclaim the word of God at times. And of course, we see it with Jesus as well. Another way, the best way to respond to God's call, to respond to God's word, is to repent, to turn around, to be transformed by God's word, to stop doing what you're doing, to repent and follow Jesus again. We'll see this next week as we look at the prophet Jonah. The city of Nineveh responds with repentance. That is obviously the best way to respond. And yet, Eli doesn't respond in either of those ways. Eli responds in this strange, passive way. He hears what Samuel says. He hears this word from the Lord that his house is about to be destroyed, his whole family destroyed. And Eli says... It is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. It's such a strange response. Eli doesn't put on sackcloth and ashes. He doesn't change his behavior. He doesn't try to convince his sons to stop sinning. 
He just sits back and lets God do whatever God is going to do without responding internally at all, it seems. This is not the way to respond to God, and yet it is a way that we are so tempted to respond with. We are often tempted to sit back, to be passive, and to just see what God is going to do without letting God's word change us and transform us. God's word is not meant to fall on us and produce nothing. It is meant to transform us. That is what God's word does. Is God's word of law, is God's word of you are doing something wrong, God's word of repent comes to us, it transforms us. It transforms our thoughts, words, and actions and has us turn around and change. As God's word of gospel comes to us, his word of good news, his word of forgiveness, life, salvation, it transforms us, it changes us, it renews us, it recreates us totally and entirely. When God's word comes to us, it cannot fall empty. It must transform us. That's what God's word is supposed to do. So as we look at the life of Samuel after this, he grows up, he becomes a kingmaker. He anoints King Saul. King Saul doesn't obey God, and so the kingdom is taken from Saul. And then Samuel anoints another king, King David. And from David's lineage, from David's heritage, one of his ancestors is, of course, a different king, an ultimate king, the king, Jesus. Samuel begins the process of establishing Jesus' earthly line on earth as he anoints King David as king. We could learn a lot from Samuel. There's a lot of things to learn, but I think today there are two main things that I want to take away from Samuel's call. The first is that God never gives up on us. God keeps calling us. He keeps calling us even when we don't hear the first few times, even when we don't hear the hundredth time. He never gives up on you. He never gives up on your family. He never gives up on your friends. He will keep calling again and again and again. And the second thing is that God's word is meant to transform us. God's word is meant to be received by us and change us from the inside out so that our thoughts, our words, our actions are all transformed and we look different. We look forward to the day when Jesus returns and he calls to us one single word and that is our names. He calls us forth from our graves with our names and we rise from the dead, transformed totally and entirely to live with him forever. Amen. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of our heavenly father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and abide with you all. Amen. A reminder that you can continue to do online giving through our online giving service online. This is at flcconcord.org slash giving. Also, if you want to submit prayer requests, we, we are open to receiving those. You can do that at flcconcord.org slash prayers. At this time, we continue the service as we confess our common faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. Together we confess. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We now turn to the Lord in prayer. A reminder that uh, we record this service a couple days before Sunday, but one of the prayer requests that we have for today is for Ingrid, one of our members who's been hospitalized. So we, we remember Ingrid in our prayers, especially today. Let us pray. 
for all who have not yet answered the call of the gospel, that they might listen, be transformed, and follow Jesus. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For those who are hospitalized, especially Ingrid, that God would provide healing, comfort, and his glorious presence. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all those who are sick, especially Doug, Bridget, Ellen, Sherry, and all those that we name now silently or aloud. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all caretakers, Lord, that you would strengthen them, reassure them, and surround them with love and community. Especially today we pray for Paula, Eric, Diane, Harry, Carolyn, Judy, Robin, Diane, and all other caretakers. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For our nation, Lord, for peace and justice to prevail, for your almighty hand to guide our leaders, and for safety at the inauguration of President-elect Biden. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now receive the blessing of the Lord placed upon his people for generations. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. We sing the closing hymn, Sing Praise to the God of Israel. Thank you for joining us today. Hope you can join us for a Bible study at 1030. Take care.